Chapter V. Brian Young and the Laws of the Land. I would rather you would cut me into inch pieces than to flinch from my duty, the Lord being my helper. I would rather live with a few men who will serve the Lord than live with ten thousand hypocrites. Mill. Star 1435. The restoration of the gospel was established under God's direction with principles, doctrines, and ordinances that should have lasted for centuries. The prophet Joseph Smith left the saints with inspired words, revelations and a most noble example. But he knew the weaknesses of his people, and advised them to hold tenaciously to their faith, without compromising. He compared their sufferings with the prophets of old. You are not as yet brought into as trying circumstances as with the ancient prophets and apostles. Call to mind Daniel, the three Hebrew children, Jeremiah, Paul, Stephen, and many others, too numerous to mention, who were stoned, sawn asunder, tempted, slain with a sword, and wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains, and hid in dens and caves of the earth, yet they all obtained a good report through faith, and amidst all their afflictions, they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to receive persecution for Christ's sake. We know not what we shall be called to pass through before Zion is delivered and established, therefore, we have great need to live near to God, and always be in strict obedience to all his commandments, that we may have a conscience void of offence toward God and man. T.P.J.S., page 32. Every man, regardless of how prominent in the church, was warned of sin and apostasy. Joseph gave specific warnings as though they were some foreboding or premonition of a future betrayal. On one occasion his admonition began with the quorum of twelve. O ye twelve! And all saints! Profit by this important key that in all your trials, troubles, temptations, afflictions, bonds, imprisonments and death, see to it, that you do not betray heaven, that you do not betray Jesus Christ, that you do not betray the brethren, that you do not betray the revelations of God, whether in Bible, Book of Mormon, or Doctrine and Covenants or any other that ever was or ever will be given and revealed unto man in this world or that which is to come. T.P.J.S., page 156. Even while the prophet was living, the betrayal of trusts and the influence of apostasy affected many of the leading elders. From out of the original quorum of twelve there were but two who stood the test. Joseph remarked that, of the twelve apostles chosen in Kirtland, and ordained under the hands of Oliver Cowdery, David Whitmer and myself, there have been but two, but what have lifted their heel against me namely Brian Young and Heber C. Kimball. D.H.C. 5 412. Right bracket after the death of the prophet Joseph, the saints were consigned to the strong leadership of Brian Young. He led them from out of the civilized mobs in the east, and took them to the barren wilderness. And here they were safe and protected from the Gentiles by many miles. They could enjoy the fruits of their labors and the freedom that had been vouchsafed to them by God and the Constitution. The government had been established to guarantee freedom of religion, of the press, and of meetings. But when the devil's mobbers couldn't reach the Mormons, he turned the government into a huge legalized mob. Formerly little bands of persecutors destroyed property and tortured the Mormons, but now the government took over with their obnoxious laws, kangaroo courts, and military forces. The odds were against the saints, and the outcome seemed to result in the overthrow of one or the other. Under such stress, their faith began to fail them, and when their money, their property, and families were put upon the altar, the sacrifice was too much. They would concede by bartering principles for peace. The first major compromise between saints and sinners was over the marriage covenant. Some authors have tried to excuse the church from the obligation of sustaining the law of plural marriage, by saying that it had not been voted on nor accepted by the members, as a doctrine of their faith as stated in the following quote. President Young spoke on the subject dash and the revelation was read to the congregation comma and that was all there was to it. No vote was called for. No alternatives were offered. No reasons were given. That manifesto, Gilbert Fulton, page 132 but history records the matter in a different light. There on the 29th of August, 1852, the revelation on celestial marriage, first recorded from the lips of the prophet Joseph Smith on July 12, 1843, was read to the assembled saints and sustained by the uplifted hands of the large congregation as a doctrine of their faith and a revelation from the Almighty. History of Utah, Orson F. Whitney, I, 493. Now plural marriage was a part of the doctrinal creed of the Mormons. It was their obligation to sustain it as one of God's laws, irrespective of any threats or opposition from their enemies. 
Ryan Young would make no changes or concessions with the government. Right bracket other leaders in the church realized the obligation that this law and principle of the gospel had upon them as people, and it was meant to continue until the millennium. The law of the patriarchal order of marriage belongs to this dispensation, and after it was revealed to the prophet Joseph, he was commanded to receive it. If he and the people had rejected it, the church and kingdom of God would have advanced no further, and God would have taken it from them and given it to another people. Life of Wilford Woodruff, Cowley, page 546. The reason why the church and kingdom of God could not progress if we did not receive the patriarchal law of marriage, is that it belonged to this dispensation, as well as the baptism for the dead, and any law or ordinance that belongs to this dispensation, must be received by the members of the church, or it cannot progress. Life of Wilford Woodruff, Cowley, page 542. Government leaders were beginning to call plural marriage and slavery the twin relics of barbarism. In 1862 President Lincoln signed an anti-polygamy bill which made the Mormon people outlaws. Church leaders then knew that a showdown was inevitable. Either the church would be overcome by Gentile persecution and the laws, or else the laws of God would somehow prevail. Brian Young said. I can deliver a prophecy upon it and I tell you for I know it it will sail over, and ride triumphantly above all the prejudice and priestcraft of the day. Mill. Star 1531. Brian Young had always experienced conflict with the laws of man against the laws of God. At Camp Douglas preparations were made for the purpose of making a descent with an armed force upon press. Brian Young with a writ for his arrest. It was 1863, and an affidavit was made before the Chief Justice J. F. Kinney, charging Brian Young with violating the Act of Congress by taking another wife. This was given to the marshal who arrested him. But the grand jury failed to indict him on the grounds of insufficient evidence, and he was released. Right bracket on October 2, 1871, President Brian Young was arrested on a charge of unlawful cohabitation. Being sick at the time and unable to leave his home, the prisoner was permitted to remain at his residence in charge of a deputy U.S. Marshal. After months of delay he was granted his freedom with other leading members of the church on grounds of a technicality that the jury bringing the indictments was not selected and summoned in conformity with the law. The government was pressing the issue for statehood. The saints would have to compromise by abandoning plural marriages before they could be accepted as a state. Press. Brian Young retorted. Now then, it is said that this polygamy must be done away before we are permitted to receive our place as a state in the Union. Do you think that we shall ever be admitted as a state into the Union without denying the principle of polygamy? If we are not admitted until then, we shall never be admitted. JD 11 269. But the showdown looked too ominous for many Mormons, and they hoped for some ram in the thicket they thought, perhaps the Lord would consider the gravity of the situation, and give a revelation to revoke plural marriage. This would relieve the persecutions, prosecutions, and also allow Utah to become a state. Brian Young spoke directly to such persons in his usual unmistakable manner. There is no halfway house. The childish babble about another revelation is only evidence of how half-informed men can talk. The Mormons have either to spurn their religion and their God, and sink half-damned in the eyes of all civilization at a moment when most blessed in the practice of their faith, or go calmly on to the same issue which they have always had. The doctrine of polygamy with the Mormons is not one of the kind that in the religious world is classed with non-essentials. It is not an item of doctrine that can be yielded, and faith in the system remain. The whole question, therefore, narrows itself to this in the Mormon mind. Polygamy was revealed by God, or the entire fabric of their faith is false. To ask them to give up such an item of belief is to ask them to relinquish the whole, to acknowledge their priesthood a lie, their ordinances a deception right bracket, and all they have toiled for, lived for, bled for, prayed for, or hoped for, a miserable failure and a waste of life. Mill. Star 27 673. The Lord revealed the gospel with all of its eternal principles. This principle of plural marriage was one of those eternal laws of the gospel. The Lord had said. Wherefore, verily I say unto you that all things unto me are spiritual, and not at any time have I given unto you a law which was temporal, for my commandments are spiritual, they are not natural nor temporal, neither carnal nor sensual. D&C 29 colon 34, 35. For God doth not walk in crooked paths, neither doth he turn to the right hand nor to the left, neither doth he vary from that which he hath said, therefore his paths are straight, and his course is one eternal round. 
D&C 3.2. Joseph had warned the saints that the principle of plural marriage would always cause opposition and persecution. The true saints of God would of necessity expect opposition if they lived all of God's laws. It is thought by some that our enemies would be satisfied with my destruction, but I tell you that as soon as they have shed my blood, they will thirst for the blood of every man in whose heart dwells a single spark of the spirit of the fullness of the gospel. Asterisk 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 it is not only to destroy me but every man and woman who dares believe the doctrines that God hath inspired me to teach to this generation. Fate of the Persecutors N. B. Lundwall, page 144. Rather than compromise, or ever grumble because they must pay the price of persecution, strong leaders of the church tried to prepare the saints for the price of the sacrifice they were expected to make. A man that enters this church ought to be able to die for its principles if necessary, and certainly should be able to go to prison for them without crying about the matter. If you are sentenced to prison for marrying more wives than one, round up your shoulders and bear it like men and no murmuring about it, prepare yourselves to take the consequences. George Buchanan J.D. 20 276. Right bracket Brian Young was a fearless man that could not sacrifice principle for expediency. He had expressed such sentiments all of his life. In Norvu he said, If there are not more than ten men who hang on to the truth, and to Joseph and the temple, and are willing to do right in all things, let me be one of that number. If there should be but ten left, and their lives should be threatened, threatened with destruction by mobs, the temple not be built, etc., because they are determined to do right, let me be one that is martyred for the truth. Minutes of LDS meeting held in Norvu, September 8, 1844, see Times and Seasons, 5 647 to 687. Brian never claimed to be anyone or anything more than a servant of the Lord, trying to keep the saints living the gospel as restored through the prophet Joseph Smith. He said, You may say Joseph was a devil, if you like, but he is at home and still holds the keys of the kingdom, which were committed to him by heavenly messengers, and always will. Do you ask who brother Brian is? He is an humble instrument in the hands of God, to keep his people in the path he has marked out through the instrumentality of his servant Joseph, and to travel in which is all I ask of them. Cont. 10 colon 2. President Young realized that not everyone who claimed to be a saint would prove to be one. He likened this mixture of half-converted saints to sheep and goats. I have often heard men say they were convinced that Mormonism is true and that they would cleave to it, but as for their hearts being converted, it is altogether another thing. For you will always find that the goats will run and lick salt with the sheep, and the Lord who made them has placed them in the world to serve his own purpose. The Lord must and will have a company of saints who will follow him to the cross if it be necessary, and these he will crown. Day. News, April 7, 1852. Thus, the saints were always to be plagued with semi-apostates whom the Lord used to test and try the faithful. Judas was in the quorum of Jesus, and Joseph had Judases in his quorum. And every quorum since has had one or more half-apostate members who loved the world more than the Lord. Right bracket Brian Young stood like a lion for the Lord he was strong and valiant for every principle of the gospel. An example such as his, in our own generation, should be enough to promote a firm unshaken faith in men who bear the priesthood. It is inconceivable to imagine President Brian Young sacrificing a principle of the gospel for any reason. We should be just as firm in our own convictions. President George Q. Cannon and other leading church men in prison. For a few years after the death of Brian Young, these men still would not compromise the eternal laws of God for the changeable laws of men.